So, it turns out that you are all in for a great treat. So, I was actually having a conversation with Jesse a little while ago, um, getting ready to introduce him, and I was amazed to learn that he is a former astronaut, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, seven years on the International Space Station, he actually got bored of it, so now he leads a red team. Um, and if you believe all that, he's got a lot to tell us about the spearfishing experience, right? So he's going to tell us about the real-world uh, trial uh, and errors that he made building and running a red team. Um, and also, um, why to do things in a very opsec safe way and how to get a foothold with spearfishing. Um, so, and of course, in the, in the ISS tradition, we're going to start off with the way we did there, uh, you know, to our comrades. Shot of vodka, cheers. Good luck. Thanks. Hey everyone, so my talk is called Purple Haze, the Spearfishing Experience, featuring me. <laughs> <clears throat> so just a little bit about me, if, you, if we never met before. Uh, my name is Jesse Nebling. I'm on an internal red team, um, a former consultant. I was consulting for about seven years before I joined this team this year. Um, it's at a big four consulting firm or accounting firm. I'm not allowed to say the name right now, but I'm based out of Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm mostly focused on Windows exploitation, uh, purple team advocate. Um, really just I'm in for the collaboration between red teams and blue teams because that's really how we all get better, right? Uh, on the side, I do some music production, electronic music. I play guitar in a punk band, um, free parking. Check them out. They're cool. Uh, and I'm just stoked to be here overall. So during this, uh, I just want you to think and take this to heart. During a red team operation, treat the attackers like a real adversary. I think that's important. That's how you're going to learn to figure out how to detect certain things, figure out how to respond to it properly. Um, if, you, if you're not doing that, you're not going to get much value from the red team. And then afterwards, make sure you have collaboration. So what's the point of my talk? Um, I'm going to walk through some of the trial and error I've had as a red teamer, uh, and also what blue teams have done when I was consulting, and now the, the blue team I work with directly. Uh, pinpoint some areas that hopefully will help some of you think a little bit differently from an attacker's mindset, um, tighten security, and p potentially uh, help you foster some new detection controls, and just give you the blue teamers in the room um, a glimpse of, of how adversaries uh, think and how we're plotting against you. So overall, um, I'm just going to go over recon, some adversarial OPSEC that we put in place to figure out if the blue team is catching on to what we're doing and also uh, dive into malicious attachments. Some old stuff, some new stuff. Hopefully you guys learn something from it. So first, um, with recon, uh, you know, we, we look to see what's publicly out there, who is subdomain, all that jazz. Everyone knows that. Um, and then we start trying to craft our spear phishing campaigns, looking for things uh, like job openings that have the technologies that your business is using, looking up social media to see if you know, your employees are saying what tools that you have in your environment, uh, anything that we can really pull together to uh, understand what your tech stack is and also potentially craft a, a campaign to, to go against you. Also, we, we look for things like uh, services that might be available. Um, the, and we could potentially look for things that like maybe single auth uh, on your external environment so we could attack that later. And I think the last bullet point is a big one. Um, I'm going to show you a screenshot next in the next slide, but bouncing emails off of domains, you can pull a bunch of good information from that. Um, really what we're using all of this for, uh, the firewall rules, looking for the things in is in your public environment, uh, we will create firewall rules for our C2 servers so we could potentially um, narrow the scope. If you have a third-party sandbox or something like that, it won't be able to pull our payloads and actually run their sandboxing against it and, and so on. Um, looking for those single-factor um, auth entry points. Uh, looking for anything that is actually environmentally um, unique to your environment so we can key in on that and, and craft our payloads further. So uh, the left image, 
hopefully you can see it, but uh, that's bouncing an email off of some random company. Um, might be a real company, I don't know. But uh, they actually have the internal domain name um, readily available. This is more for if you have SMTP servers like on-prem. Uh, cloud services prevent a lot of this. Uh, and then you can also see at the bottom, um, it says pphosted.com. So that also gives me the knowledge that your corporation or your business is using Proofpoint. So that'll help me craft um, how I'm going to attack you uh, through, through attachments or, or whatever it is. The other one is a pretty old technique, um, but it's still viable. I've used it a ton of times when I was consulting. Um, looking for MS Link or if you're still using Link for some reason, or Skype for Business, you can basically send an NTLM authentication request to uh, that server and pull back a Base64 encoded um, blob that basically has all of your internal domain information and also the, the internal ser server name. I have a, some references. Hopefully, the this, this slides will, will get out um, sometime soon that you guys can click that and, and look through it more. So some potential areas of detection for this. Um, anyone that's you know, mass downloading externally hosted files to pull metadata to see what versions your software is uh, within Office or, or uh, Adobe or anything like that so we can craft things against that. Emails uh, potentially being bounced against non-existent email accounts. That's what I showed in that one image. Um, this is a, a lot harder if you if your business has a lot of clients, but if you know you can potentially whitelist uh, specific domains, then you can crack down on that a little bit more for maybe a smaller business. And then you know just brute forcing against single factor auth uh, that that's pretty easily detected. Uh, a lot of people still don't detect on that though. I put in a couple points that I've ha I've struggled with uh, when I was doing these assessments. Um, you know, it, it, it costs more time to the attacker overall if I can't figure out what your egress points are from your network, from the publicly available stuff, um, it, anything that's registered under your company's name. If, if you have a third party or like your internet service provider is, is what's pulled from, from that recon, then I'm not going to be able to change the firewall rules to narrow down on, on what can access my payloads. Um, if your environment has multi-factor all over the place, it's going to be much harder for me to uh, spray anything. Um, I usually try not to do that anyway because it's too noisy, but you know some people do. If employees only have general job descriptions, uh, basically anything that's uh, not related to your tech stack, then that's going to make it harder for me to figure out what's in your environment so I can further um, do some tests and, against those tools and potentially get by them. And then the last one, uh, wildcard emails aren't allowed, so I can't bounce off. Or you have like a, a cloud service for your email, um, you, you won't be able to pull that internal domain information from those. I made a, a toolkit for um, looking up some basic recon for networking. You can follow that if, if you like. So the next one, uh, I'm running into adversarial OPSEC. Uh, testing dropper malware, this is a topic on its own. I'm not going to cover it too much today. But just know that an adversary with, that's dedicated enough will download free trials of AV, get trials of your EDR products, and figure out ways around it. Um, you just have to kind of assume that uh, in your environment and look for anomalies. but. That's just something that you need to keep in mind. And if you want to talk about this afterwards, I'm happy to. I'm just not going to cover it with this talk. So this is uh, one technique that I've done and I've figured out was worked pretty well to figure out if uh, incident response or the blue team was onto my campaign. I would set up uh, basically a web server that is not related to any of my other, other C2 infrastructure. and whatever payload I'm sending will basically send a benign web request to like an image or something like that. Once that image gets uh, pulled or gets requested, then I'll get a text message. This works twofold because basically I'll get a text message, one, if the actual victim has clicked my link and I know that I'm about to get a shell. Or two, if there's multiple requests happening, I'm getting a ton of text messages. I'm like, oh shit, the, the blue team's probably on me. Let me burn down that infrastructure and, and start somewhere else. 
Uh, I've also seen some people do UNC path injection and pull NTLM v2 hashes over the internet. Uh, if you have SMB outbound, I'm gonna, you probably shouldn't, but you, <laughs> I've seen it at like 50% of the clients that I've worked at, so. Uh, I just have some sample code for the text messages for the red teamers in the room, and then under that for the blue teamers in the room, I actually have the user agents that Office products use. Um, it might be helpful for people that are sandboxing uh, the payloads or any, any of the documents that they're receiving or if they think something is malicious, you could potentially use this in, in tune your sandbox a little bit more. This is another technique that I, I came up with, um, basically using one-time use tokens. So whenever your payloads, if you're staging, request out to a server that you know I own, um, there's a database set up that will have all the usages of that token. If the token gets requested one time from my payload, then it'll actually serve up the legit payload and start the process of downloading and executing whatever um, the, the flow is. If there's more than once, uh, you can set however many times you want it to, to work, but if, if it, the token gets requested more than once, then potentially uh, that, it, is probably a blue team. So that will redirect to something benign and then uh, you won't be able, the incident response teams won't be able to actually pull that down. Also, don't request my payloads with wget. That's just gonna get redirected. I've seen it a lot. Um, it's just something that I need to point out. So some areas of potential detection there. Um, office, any, document reading process that has outbound connectivity. You know, this is kind of a no-brainer, but if some people are new, that it, it might be good information. Any type of outbound con network connectivity should be looked at further. There's a chance it's not malicious. A better chance it probably is. Um, any malicious links from non-trusted domains, obviously, uh, that's a much harder one to crack down on if, if you have a big environment. Uh, those user agents that I called out earlier, and then this one uh, is kind of counterintuitive to the first bullet for my incident response and defense tips, but if there's one of those campaigns that's more mass phishing, uh, that is, has the tokens that are being used, and you want to pull that payload, you could potentially look for those unread emails, click that link, download the payload, and analyze it that way. And that kind of goes into the next tip, which is don't do that. <laughs> uh, you're better off just pulling the payload from uh, one of the users that already clicked it and analyzing it that way. Uh, and that kind of goes and coincides with that wget request that I was talking about earlier. Um, this one is just kind of an overarching one. You guys probably hate hearing it, but just assume that adversary knows how to get around your tools. Um, look for things after, you know, you're gonna get low-hanging fruit and unexperienced attackers, but look for things like, you know, that guy in finance opening up PowerShell and executing commands, because that's obviously gonna be something that um, shouldn't happen or wouldn't happen normally. And then the last one, I kind of touched on it, disable your SMB outbound traffic, that's ridiculous. So uh, some malicious attachments. Uh, you know, there's email security and sandboxing services out there that you can rely on. You can hold on it as a crutch, but I wouldn't make that, you know, it's not a silver bullet by any means. Um, you can modify some publicly known payloads pretty easily and get by them. And I'm gonna run through a, a couple things that we do as red teamers. So one, uh, this is kind of an older tactic, um, but it still works wonderfully, so I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of it. Uh, it's called remote template injection. So the idea behind it is you have a normal non-malicious document and it actually calls out to an office template that is hosted on a staging server elsewhere. So basically that template has the malicious code in it so once the document is opened, it pulls the template down, and then there's a macro in the document. Uh, I kind of wrote the steps for the red teamers if they're curious about doing it. You just edit an XML file. But for the blue teamers in the room, this basically, uh, it allows docx files, which typically don't have macros in them, to be used as a malicious document. So that'll get by, you know, 
quite a few email filters. Um, the other side of this is when this actually occurs, um, you can take the, the template down. It, it, it depends if you have the, the firewall rules in place, but if you don't, you can take the template down while the email sandbox is doing its thing against the document. And basically, when it, once it's making those requests out, you'll see that there's like third-party sandboxes in like Azure or, or uh, AWS requesting a ton of times to your server looking for the template. Once that dies down, it's usually between five and 20 minutes, you can just rehost the template because the sandbox will send that document to the user, the victim, whoever you're targeting, and they'll open it, and hopefully by that time, uh, you have the template back up, and it'll just pull the template down, and you get that malicious code execution. Um, there's some actually pretty unique indicators for this, uh, for the, the templates being requested by Office products. Um, and I just put those there for the blue teamers as reference. These slides will be up later. Uh, but it, it's a pretty unique set of requests that get sent out once it's pulling those templates. Uh, this is you know, the try and true method. Everyone knows about VBA macros. It's gone through a million iterations. Um, it's gone to the point where you kind of have to hide in plain sight. Windows Defender is catching on to basically everything, and I assume that the other AV vendors are, are going to catch up eventually. But uh, things like WMI execution is old school. PowerShell cradles, uh, <laughs> that'll get caught most likely. Hiding variables and document properties, XML data, and then I just came up with this <laughs> method of actually hiding um, code in alternative text of images. And then the week I was about to execute, uh, Microsoft put in a new alert that actually says that uh, it's an obfuscated macro, so you, you can't do that anymore. But there's a really good talk on this uh, at DerbyCon, I think last year, 2018, uh, where they, they talk a lot more about this, and it's definitely a good one to view for, for blue teamers. But basically, we're doing things like re reversing strings, just replacing characters, hiding it just straight in the, the normal macro instead of pulling different properties of, of the documents. Um, staging the payloads, you know, you don't want to put all of your malicious code in the payload because if that gets caught, then your C2 infrastructure is burned. So um, having that outside, that next step, uh, is a good way to kind of thwart some of burning the infrastructure you set up and took so long to, to do. And then just executing outside of Office Ancestry. This is really... Um, it's a pretty well-known way to do things, and EDR tools nowadays all detect on if you're executing as a child process of like an Office product. But uh, as an attacker, we always have to execute outside of Office. And I, I put an example up of just that hiding in plain sight macro for the blue teamers. So you, if you're analyzing something, you can see what is actually occurring here. Um, I cut out the execution side because that's all public knowledge. So this one um, is actually something that I came up with as well, but it was based off of a talk by Stan Hecht at DerbyCon uh, 2018. This uh, Excel 4.0 macros, for those of you that don't know, is an old language within Excel that uh, it basically allows you to uh, hook Windows APIs and just call DLLs directly through Excel. So it, it's pretty awesome. Um, the method that he showed off was really more around doing direct shellcode injection, but I didn't like that that much because unless you uh, change your shellcode to execute outside of the Office product, it'll execute as a child process of Excel, which will get caught by an EDR product. So I wanted to do something different. And also, uh, you know, everything there will give away your C2 infrastructure if that's the case. So I came up with my own attack flow. Uh, I use Excel 4.0 as a downloader, basically just calling the Windows DLL uh, URL mon to download a file. And then you can hybrid it and actually call a VBA function as well through Excel 4.0. So you can do that for execution. Since in the uh, VBA, it's, it doesn't say auto open it'll get by a lot of email filters. Their email filters aren't really looking for these Excel 4.0 macros yet. 
Um, I also included some of the, the user agents that uh, get requested when this occurs, just so you guys also know what's going on um, and have something to, to write off of if you, if you can tune your sandboxes. So some points of discovery. Uh, the first one's obvious. Hopefully everyone knows that if a document has making outbound network connectivity, uh, then there's probably an issue. Uh, that probably doesn't happen, but sometimes it does, but it's something to look into at least. Uh, VBA scripts run from documents. You know, EDR tools nowadays, they, they look into these. Uh, at least you can flag on them uh, with, with a basic setup. But again, if it's not like your accounting guy that is running macros all day, then there's probably some issue going on, um, some, some malicious activity. Executing as a child process of office products, if that ever occurs and you don't have an EDR solution, then look into that. that probably shouldn't be happening either. Um, any old format versions of Office documents, so .doc, .xls, um, you can actually prevent those from even being opened in your environment through GPO. So that's an approach you could take if you don't have like legacy documents, which, you know, let's, let's get to the, the 21st century now. Um, and then the last one I think is probably the, the biggest one Looking for these functions specifically uh, within the macros. The first one is, is shellcom. So you can call that CLSID and basically execute as a child process of Explorer instead of, um, instead of the, the Office document itself. The rest of them are basically used as downloaders or other ways of execution. The one that I really wanted to point out was the active sheet uh, visible equals false. I use this all the time in phishing campaigns because it's how I sway users to click something. Basically, what that is doing is making an image invisible. So I'll just overlay an image on a document that says, hey, this is in privacy mode, this is in protected mode. Enable content to view the actual document. So that'll make somebody that's not too experienced just click enable content. The image disappears, it looks legit, they don't really know what's going on. So that's definitely a bigger one that I haven't seen too many people call out. Um, and then the other two are, are just really around the, the hiding in plain sight aspect of things. So um, for the incident response tip here, sandboxing a payload on a system that is actually representative of your domain, because we did all of that recon in the first place, so we potentially know your internal domain name. If it's just a third-party sandbox service, there's a chance that it's not connected to your domain. Um, and if it's not, then we'll just cut execution right there and not do anything malicious. So that's a pretty important step. I see a lot of people fail doing that, um, but it, it's something that you can, you can at least be cognizant of moving forward. And then uh, the last one, this is a really well-known tool, OLE Dump. If, if you don't know that, um, you should probably look into it. It's a really good blue teaming tool uh, that you can scrape VBA macros. And they also just made a plugin for Excel 4.0 macros to see what's actually being executed. Um, and you can scrape that content and actually do an analysis against it to see if it's malicious. And I just linked the Didier Stevens tool, the OLE Dump at the bottom. So this last one is pretty new. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a talk on this tomorrow, so hopefully he goes in more detail. I'm going to be brief about it, though. Um, the, the overall concept here is you can send a, a meeting event to somebody, and it'll just pop up on their calendar. This was pretty, uh, there's, there's some big news about it recently with, with scammers doing it. Um, I took it kind of the ne next level and did it more as a, an adversary where I would just attach like a WebEx meeting and then say, hey, you need to, uh, an automated update didn't get pushed to your box and we need to do a manual update on your system. They would join the WebEx and you just talk them through giving you mouse and keyboard control, download the payload, say, hey, you're updated. Um, open up the office product or whatever and say, oh yeah, the version looks like it's up to date, you're good to go. If you have any questions, go to your local IT desk. Um, so that works really well and it's, it's kind of a, <laughs> something that hasn't really been done or I've seen talked about too much, um, but I've popped shells that way. Uh, 
there's a lot more scammers doing it with just like random links to something malicious that say you want a free iPhone, but just ignore that. Um, so some points of discovery for, for that are, uh, again, meeting, meetings originating from non-trusted domains. This is going to be much harder for bigger organizations, but if you know your client base, you could potentially flag on that. Uh, the other one is any meetings that appear without an actual email invite, that's an indicator. Um, honestly, I don't know a way to go in and look at that as a red teamer, but it's something to think about and potentially look at um, as blue teamers. And then uh, as a tip, just get the business to disable automatic adding of invitations to calendars because that'll make sure that they don't get that notification pop up that, oh, I have a meeting in 10 minutes. I have to make sure I join this. Um, that, that's really the only tip I have right now. Hopefully, um, tomorrow at the coalition talk, he talks a little bit more about it. But yeah. So that's it for me. Uh, this was actually my first con talk. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, we, if, if you want to talk a little bit more afterwards, meet me at the bar. Sorry if I spoiled your OPSEC by saying where you were working for the past seven years. Space Station. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. And we're going to be outside for some Q&A. And I think we have a break now as some red team people check in. So, thank you. <laughs>